now, right? Romans chapter number 15, verse number 1, the Bible reads, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now that's basically Romans chapter number 14 in a nutshell. Romans chapter number 14 was him explaining basically to put up or to suffer you know, immature Christians, babe Christians, people that are newly saved that come in that maybe don't have everything right, maybe in an area, and I'm not talking about somebody coming in here with an open sin. I'm talking about something that is considered, you know, a preference, right? Something along the lines that is, you know, something that is not necessarily wrong if they do. You know, it's not wrong to, like the example that they give, to acknowledge the Sabbath day, if you will. It's not wrong to just eat vegetables. There's nothing wrong with that. So he gives you the example of, you know, you need to put up with them. You shouldn't receive them to doubtful disputations where you're just constantly tearing them down. You're just constantly arguing with them about things. That's not what you should do. Now, last week I pointed out the, you know, continuity from Romans chapter 13 into Romans chapter 14. And in Romans chapter 13, we saw there at the end where he begins to speak about the neighbor, about loving your neighbor. And he talks about loving your neighbor, and then he ends the chapter there in verse number 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. Then he goes into Romans 14, and he explains not to make a provision for your neighbor's flesh. And this is a way to love your neighbor. And the reason I point that out is look at Romans chapter number 15, verse number 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. So notice right here we can see the conclusion of what we were speaking about. Romans 13, halfway through the chapter, all the way through Romans 14, speaking about loving your neighbor, which is loving your brother, right? And then he gives you an, a, a practical example of suffering them if they were to come into the church or if there's something that they're hung up on that you know bothers them that they doubt about you don't want them to fall into sin and put a stumbling block before your brother over something like that uh, now keep your hand here and go over to galatians chapter number six galatians chapter number six galatians chapter number six i'll point out something uh interesting to you galatians chapter number six real quick look at the end of galatians chapter number, or the beginning of galatians chapter six look at verse number one he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, let that, lest thou also be tempted. So notice here in Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 1, he says, You that are spiritual, he says, restore such an one. So there's another guy that's weaker than you. There's another guy that's, that had a stumbling block and he fell, right? Look at the, uh, let's actually look here, look at Galatians chapter number 5. Let's look at the context of what he's talking about here. Look at Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he goes on to speak about loving your neighbor. And then he says in, in Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. It's real cool when you can find the parallels and the epistles like this, where you can see the context about loving your neighbor, and then you can even see the thought pattern, which is almost exactly the same. Hey, restore another brother. Look out for another brother. Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one, right? And then he, he says in, Rome, in uh, Romans chapter number 15, verse number 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So what we can learn from that is the strong are the spiritual. Those that are weak are not spiritual. Now when people will say... Sometimes I've even heard in Romans chapter number 14 in the very beginning there when it's speaking of a weak brother, when it says uh, in verse number 14, or verse 1, chapter 14, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye but not to doubtful disputations. You keep reading, it says, let, uh, let not him, oh I'm sorry, verse 2 it is. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. I've heard people take that so literal that they say he's weak because he's eating herbs, because he's not eating meat. That's obviously not what it's saying. Talking about, he tells you in verse 1 in that chapter that it's, a, it's talking about a spiritual person. Not only that, chapter 15, verse 1, we then that are strong ought to bear. You're not strong because you eat meat. Maybe the spiritual meat. Maybe that's what it's talking about, but not physical meat. It's talking about your spiritual maturity. In Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 1, being a parallel, tells you, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual. So you can see that parallel there. The strong are the spiritual. Those that are weak 
or those that are not spiritual. They would be babes in Christ or maybe just someone that is like this example here, overtaken in the fall. You know, it's someone that is backslidden, if you will. Go back to Romans chapter number 15. Again, we'll read verse number 3 now. For even Christ pleased not himself. So he gives us the example, the perfect example, of course. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee. So this is from Christ's pers Christ perspective. The reproaches of them that reproach thee, says, fell on me. Right? Because he bore our, our reproaches. That's a perfect example. He talks about bearing one another's burden. If we were to keep reading there in Galatians chapter number 6, the next couple of verses are bearing you one another's burdens. Talks, and then here he goes into, so you can see a strong parallel. He goes into Christ bearing our burdens, right? Look at verse number uh, 4. For whatsoever things were written afore time were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So right there you get the purpose of why the Bible was written, the things of the Old Testament. It's for two reasons. It's for patience, through, for pa or th through patience, I'm sorry. It says, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. So the two things are comfort and hope. Through patience of the scriptures, reading the scriptures, that you might gain comfort and you might gain hope. Faith, right? Growing in faith. Verse number five. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you... To be like-minded one toward another, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. Verse number six: That ye may be, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep your hand here. And go over to Philippians chapter number two. Philippians chapter number two. Another parallel here in Philippians chapter number two. We saw there that it told us about that you may glory. It says that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. The verse before that talks about the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded. So being like-minded is to be of the same mind, to be of one mind, to be of one mouth, right? We're all speaking the same things. We are all thinking the same things in the spirit of God, of course. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. So he's saying if there's any consolation in Christ, right? Now if you remember what we read in Romans 15, 5, it said, Now the God of patience and consolation, right? The God of patience and consolation. Two verses later, it says that, it says that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice God in Romans 15 is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You look over at Philippians chapter number 2. We're going to read this in just a moment, but it's the famous passage about being like-minded, right? In the very beginning, he starts off about there being consolation in Christ. That's because the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's the God of consolation, is Christ. There's one God. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, notice comfort bring, being brought up, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. So we can see here the fellowship of the Spirit, the way that we're supposed to be one, you know, in one mind, one mouth, like-minded, it's going to be through the Spirit, one Spirit. If any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, watch, he says that ye be like-minded, having, watch this, the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So we see that being mentioned again. What is the one mind? Well, everyone in here today, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. These are really interesting parallels. And you can see the, just the consistency of the Bible. It's amazing. Keep reading there, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. What is Romans 15 talking about? Verse 1, or verse 2, let every one of us please his neighbor. It's talking about esteeming others better than yourselves, right? Keep reading there. It says, uh, verse uh, 4 in Philippians 2, let, let not every, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to explain the mind of Christ, right? And let that mind be in us as well. Go back to Romans chapter 15. A lot of these parallels, you can look at them later to study, and I'm sure you'll find you know, your own independent uh, uh, comparisons or parallels. We'll look there in verse number 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. So we haven't started a whole new thought here when he says, Wherefore, receive ye one another. 
Still talking about the same thing. Brotherly love. Talking about receiving those that are strong in the faith. Helping the weak. Bearing the burdens of the weak. Just like Christ bared ours. Everyone being like-minded and looking after each other, not themselves. That statement right there, we're for receiving one another as Christ also received us for the glory of God. That's actually referring back to verse number 3 in chapter 14 where it says, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So it's, we're still talking about the exact same thought of having the mind of Christ, of us, uh, you know, allowing other pe people's approaches, bearing others' approaches, looking after our brothers, you know, esteeming others better than ourselves, right? Look there at verse number 8. Kind of changes thought right here. We'll kind of change gears. A different theme, it says in verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the Father. Verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. As it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Verse 8 is one of those verses you hear Zionists just try to rip out of context. They isolate this one verse and they just read this one verse. And they say, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. So they interpret this verse to say that he's the minister of the circumcision as in he's preaching unto the circumcision. They say, see, Jesus Christ came, you know, just for the Jews, just to save the Jews. He's a minister of the circumcision. And then after they rejected him, then, you know, the gospel is opened up unto the Gentiles. But read verse 8 and verse 9. Notice what it says. So the, the end there says, latter portion of B, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Now here, and. And is a conjunction. This is the other reason why he came. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So it doesn't just end with, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. That's not the only reason why he came. He came to save the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Everyone. Jesus Christ wants everyone to be saved. Amen. It's always been offered unto all. It's prophesied and preached all throughout the Old Testament. And that's what he quotes right here. Look at verse 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And then he says, as it is written. So he's quoting the Old Testament. People say, oh, the Old Testament. He's just the God of the Jews. You had to be a physical Jew. And if you weren't a physical Jew, you just couldn't be saved. You're just damned to hell. There's just... Makes zero sense. That's a cruel God. That's like the God of, of, of you know Calvinism, where he just he just like has this warped, warped mind that there's nothing you can do if you're born of this one lineage and of this one seed. You just have no choice in the matter at all. You're just you know because that's what that would be, and that's what you know the hardcore Zionists teach that teach that only the Jews can be saved of the Old Testament. The majority don't say that, but there's weirdos out there that would teach that only Jews. You had to be born of that lineage, and thank God Jesus came. And now we can all, you know, everyone in the New Testament. This right here is a quotation from the Old Testament. He's proving that he's not only the God of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And he says, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. Look at verse 10. And again he said, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Look at verse 11. It's interesting because if you know the patterns in the Bible where it repeats, it repeats, uh, you know, the same thing twice. This could be an example of that. When I read this, I always think this. It says in verse uh, 11, and again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and laud him. Does anyone know what the word laud means? It means praise. It means praise. That's what it means. So he says, praise him. Right there. Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. And then he says, and laud him. So he's repeating the same thing. And then he says, and laud him, all ye people. So it's almost like there, when he says ye people, he's referring to the Gentiles. Now when you look, it's interesting, in verse 8, another way to interpret this one says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. Another way to interpret this, and I'm not settled on it, would be that he's a minister of like spiritual circumcision. Of the circumcision, as in circumcision of the heart, what was he doing? He's a minister of the gospel. What is the gospel? He's, he's preaching that men may be saved. That's a possible interpretation of this. And everyone, like he tells you in Romans chapter number 2, everyone that's not saved is a Gentile. He clearly tells you that in, in Romans chapter number 2. 
And that interpretation would actually make sense if you read verse 8 and 9 together. Because he says, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles. So anyone, so that they could be circumcised and become saved. So that interpretation would actually fit with verses 8 and 9. It seems to, to make more sense. Verse 9. It says, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. And he says, as it is written for the cause, I will confess thee. For this cause, I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. So look there in uh, verse 11. We'll read that one more time. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. Verse 12. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles in him. Shall the Gentiles trust? I have you turn to Revelation chapter number twenty-two. This uh, this idea that we're getting ready to look at here for a few minutes is it's mentioned all throughout the Bible a few times in the New Testament and also a few times in the Old Testament, and that's actually a quotation. So we're going to go to Revelation chapter number twenty-two, verse number sixteen. Of course, this is speaking of Jesus Christ when it refers to him as the root of Jesse. Verse sixteen, we see Jesus Christ referring to himself as this title. Or by this title, he says in verse 16 in chapter 22 of Revelation, he says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, what does it mean to be the offspring of something? The offspring means that you are, you know, that you have been born of that, right? You came of that line. You came after that, right? Obviously, in Jesus Christ's case, case, that's referring to his flesh. He was the offspring according to his flesh. Now, what's it mean to be the root of something? It means you're before it, right? It means that, that you are the source of it. You're the progenitor. You brought that into place, right? You brought So he brought David, right, into this world, if you will, by creating Adam. But then he also came of David. This is, you know, this is really... The, uh, the pivotal point, the, 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 the focus of the entire Bible, God becoming a man. God's redemption, and how did he do it? Through man, becoming a man, right? Now, I want you to turn to an uh, interesting passage here. Go to Matthew chapter number 22. So go back, Matthew chapter number 22. So we see him referred to there as the root and the offspring, so both. Matthew chapter number 22. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 22 is towards the end. Verse 40, 42, Jesus speaking. Speaking unto the Pharisees, he says, uh, we'll start verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? So whose son is Christ? They say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How did the David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, and then he goes on. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. You have this perfectly summarized in Revelation 22, 16 where we just read. Because he is the root and the offspring. You know what? The Pharisees only acknowledged that he was the offspring. That's the problem. That's why he's speaking to him in John 8, and he's like, if you believe not that I am he. And he quizzes him here in Matthew chapter 22, and they don't have a clue. I don't know how to explain that. Why? Because they didn't believe that he was he. Because if, if they knew that, that he was God, and that the Messiah was the root, then they would have just answered, you know, they would have explained the concept of him being the root and the offspring. Because he created David, but then he came of the seed of David, right? He was born of the line or the lineage of David. That's why it says that no man was able to answer him a word, neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. He's the root and the offspring. Now I want you to go back, this is real interesting, go back to Romans <clears throat> one more time. You may not have noticed this, but in Romans chapter number 15 there, <clears throat> he says in verse 12, and again Isaiah, I'm sure, uh, yeah, yeah, it is verse 12, and again Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now, I've always read over this right here and read it like, there shall be an offspring of Jesse. But notice what it says. Read it one more time. It says, and again, Isaiah said, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him 
shall the Gentiles trust? He's talking about the God of Jesse. Right. How did David call him Lord? Because David's father was Jesse. And Jesse would call him Lord. And he's the root of Jesse and the root of David, right? Amen. Go to Revelation chapter number 4. Revelation chapter number 4, verse number 6. So Brother Dominique pointed this out. I had never noticed this in Revelation chapter number 4, verse number 6 before. Revelation chapter number 4. Is it 4? No, it's 5. That's why I thought it was 5. Yeah, it's, it's Revelation chapter number 5. Look, let's read verse 1, too. And I saw in the right hand of him, of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And this is important. Notice the, 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 the phrase that's, that's used here. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, Neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. It, it makes zero sense why this, why he would say, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And the phrase in the Old Testament where God says, Jehovah says in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 63, he says that he looked and there was no man. If people that teach that Jesus Christ was always a man, it makes zero sense. If Jehovah, the Father, standing there, he's like, you know, I looked and there was no man. And then you got this second person next to him who's eternally a man, like, I'm right here. What are you talking about? But what's taught in Revelation chapter number 5 actually expounds upon that statement when he says, I looked and there was no man. Right? So right here it says the same thing. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look there and notice, no Man, and I wept much because no man. Does it seem like there's a pattern here? He's trying to get a, a thought across to you. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. They need a man. Verse five. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. What? Well, this is you know the gospel right here. These are these are precious words. Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, what is that a reference to? His humanity, right? Christ's humanity came of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now watch what it says right here. The root of David hath, prepared, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. Now, I've always read that as the offspring of David. That's not what it says. And then when you get to Revelation chapter number 22, he says, I am the root and the offspring of David. So right here, you know who prevailed? Him that sitteth on the throne. The root of David. And then you see the vision of the man Christ Jesus, the lamb that was slain, coming to take the book out of his hand. You see him on the throne. He says, I looked and there was no man in the Old Testament. And he says, therefore my arm brought salvation unto me. He says, in my fury it upheld me. There was no man. There was no one that could open the book. So God said, I'll do it. There was no man found. So I'm going to do it myself. People that don't understand this, like, this is the coolest thing that I've ever understood in the Bible. It's the most awesome, amazing thing. It makes me look at God like, you're, he's, he's so much better. You just exalt him so much more. He's like, you know, nobody can do it. I'll do it myself. I, I looked and there was no man. You know what's interesting when you read Isaiah chapter number 63? And he says, my arm brought salvation unto me and my fury it upheld me. You go to Isaiah 53, 10 chapters prior to that, and he tells you who the arm of the Lord is, Jesus. But do you know who's speaking in Isaiah 63? The guy who comes back, Jesus. You know what everybody says? Jesus is not the Father. He's just the arm of the Father, right? Do you guys get where I'm going with this? Well, in Isaiah 63, Jesus is speaking. The guy that come back, comes back is speaking. And he says, Jesus, mine arm brought salvation unto me. Amen. You get that? Amen. And right here, there's no, there's no man that can be found, right? And notice he points out it's the root of David. He doesn't point out only that he, later on, you know, he talks about being the offspring. Right here he even mentions him being the offspring by saying the line of the tribe of Judah. So he's of Judah, right? He came of. What's of mean? From? He came all the line of Judah, but guess what? It's the root of David. That's written in your Bible to tell you that it's the guy sitting on the throne. Amen. 
Keep reading. I want to skip down a little bit. I want you to notice something. Look at verse 9. So if we would have read it in, in, in chapter number 4 real quick, let me say this. They were praising him that sitteth upon the throne, right? God, you get to uh, verse 9 here. And it says, and they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take, take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by, the blood, by, the blood, by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So they're, so they're praising the Lamb, right? And blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto Him. Watch this. Be unto Him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. So notice. When the Lamb comes and redeems them, they not only worship and praise the Lamb, they worship and praise Him that sitteth upon the throne, right? Because the Lamb is the root of David. Amen. So He receives worship and praise too because that is Him. People don't get this in 2 Corinthians 5 when the Bible says, when it's talking about in 2 Corinthians 5 that, that Jesus Christ reconciled us unto Himself. That phrase when it says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Right before that it says that God reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, right? So a lot of people read that like, oh, well, Jesus is his messenger, which is blasphemy. But they say he's like the second person that he sent. It was by his son, right? As a second person. It explains it to you. If you know what the word wit means in the Bible, like when Samson says, you know, he walked out that the Spirit of God departed from him. You know what it's saying? Like he knew not. Wit means no. It's present tense. <clears throat> so he says that God reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ. So he used Jesus Christ by Jesus Christ. And then he says to wit. He's saying to know so that you can know this. That's how the word is used all throughout the Bible. To wit. Now he's going to explain it to you. How he did it by Jesus Christ. You say, yeah, he reconciled the world by his son, the second person. No. To wit, that God was in Christ, Amen. reconciling the world unto himself. Right. So he explains it to you. You can play dumb if you want, but he says, to wit, that God was in Christ. So how did he do it by Jesus Christ? To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. That's what's going on. You know why right here we see them praising the Lamb? They all of a sudden start shifting their praise and their worship to the Lamb. And in the same breath, they worship him that sitteth on the throne and the Lamb. Because the Lamb is the root of David. He's the offspring of David and he's the root of David. You know, the Bible says in Philippians 2 that God hath given him a name which is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth. Does that sound familiar? Right here we see every creature under the sea, or in the sea, in heaven, on earth, everybody. It says that God hath given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth. And that, listen to this. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now catch this. To the glory of God the Father. Do you know why they're worshiping him that sitteth on the throne? Because he's the lamb. He is the root of David. That is the root of David. You know why the Father receives glory? Because he was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Amen. His arm brought salvation unto himself. And it's so much greater when you understand the love of God is that the majestic, the transcendent God that is beyond this universe, he is before every molecule, he is before everything that has ever existed, the Alpha and the Omega, the eternal God that's sitting upon the throne here, he doesn't just sit in glory and he's real pious and, you know, he loves us so much that he is the lamb. Yeah. He's the lamb. Amen. He died for us. Amen. He is the one. He reconciled us to us. And he didn't have to just send someone else. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to just bear this burden on anyone else. There is no man. There wasn't anybody else that could do it. Right. There's one God. You don't have any other options. He said, I'll do it. 
He looked and there was no man. They look in heaven, there's no man. And then when the man appears, they worship that lamb. But guess what? They worship him sitting on the throne too. Right. And then guess what? You get to Revelation chapter number 22, and the ram, lamb is sitting on the throne too. Yeah. It's the throne of God and of the lamb. That is, that is the revelation of the Bible. It really, you know, it, you know, it's sad that people can't get this truth sometimes because they're obstinate in their heart. Because the, the whole truth of the Bible, you know, the whole message of the Bible is the gospel. And the gospel is that God created man. There was fellowship with man and God. Man sinned against God and broke that fellowship. And there was no way that God could, could any longer have that fellowship until man was restored. And God loved mankind so much that he himself became a man and he took the punishment that mankind deserved so that they could live in eternity. What do you have at the beginning of the Bible? What do you have at the beginning of the Bible? You have paradise. You have the tree of life, right? Where God is at in fellowship with man. You get to Revelation chapter number 22 and you have that same God with fellowship restored back with man. But guess what? God is the lamb. Because God loved us so much, he became that lamb. And we will forever worship and serve and praise and laud him and praise his name, Jesus Christ, for all eternity. That name that he was given when God came down and was born on this earth as a man. You know what? He's the root of David. He created David. He created Adam. But guess what? He's the offspring of David, too. He was born of David. And when you worship and you serve the Lamb, you're worshiping and you're serving Him that sitteth upon, excuse me, Him that sitteth on the throne. Amen. You're worshiping and serving both. And, and that's why the Revelation, once you get to Revelation chapter number 22, you know, people are like, when they read that, people are like, well, this is the first time you're seeing the Father's face. No, it's the clear, the clear picture. The clear picture of the Lamb being the one and only, only eternal God. That's what it is. When you have Jesus Christ on this earth, you have him speaking in parables about people. Are like, Why don't you have a clear verse of him saying, I am the Father? Why don't you have a clear verse of him saying, I am God? The same reason. That's why. He says in, Revel in John chapter number like 16, that right now I speak unto you in parables, but later... I'm going to show you plainly of the Father. Notice who's going to show the Father. Yeah. He says, I'm going to show you plainly of the Father. Right. You say, oh, well, he's just going to step out of the way and pull a curtain, and there's going to be the Father standing behind it. Well, okay. Well, in John chapter number 14, when he says, when he showed him, what did he do? He actually showed him. Yeah. He said, show me the Father. Show us the Father. It's a fight. So they said, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? Let's use the Bible to interpret that. So when he's going to show him the Father later, he's going to show him plainly of the Father. Right. You know what he's going to be doing? God and the Lamb are going to be sitting on that throne, and we shall and we'll serve Him and His name will be on our forehead. Right. Him, His. That is the revelation of the Bible. Amen. The whole purpose of life is to glorify God. God. Restored in what in what way do we glorify him? We glorify him through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The name that he received when he was born on this earth as a man, and the name that is above every name. It was the name by it's the name of salvation, and it's the name in which he had when he redeemed us and he died on the cross. And he was hanging on that cross. That is where he receives his glorification. And that's why when you get to Revelation chapter number 22. He says, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. That's why you see the Lamb coming to him that sitteth on the throne in Revelation chapter number 5. And taking, and, and, and this is a vision, of course, and he takes the book out of his hand, and they're looking for a man. That is the man Christ Jesus, which is that same God. And it's a picture of him bringing salvation to himself. That's what's going on. And then you have the full revelation in Revelation chapter number 22 that God and the Lamb are seated upon that throne. And it's the man Christ Jesus, the one and only true God. Amen. Go back to Romans chapter number 14. Romans chapter number 14, or 15, I'm sorry. 
Romans chapter number 15. Actually, I'm sorry, I went on that rant for a long time. Go to Isaiah chapter number 11. I want to look up that passage. It's super interesting. When you actually look up the passage that's being quoted. So Isaiah 11 is where that's quoted from. Of what we just read. And I'm going to read it again to you from the New Testament. When it says in Romans chapter number 15 verse 12. And again, Isaiah saith. There shall be a root of Jesse, and he, that shall, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Right? So notice it says the root of Jesse. When you go to Isaiah chapter number 11, verse number 1, we'll begin reading. It says, and there shall come forth the rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, watch this, shall go grow out of his roots. Anybody notice that? It says here that there's going to be a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and then it says, and a branch shall grow out of his root. Who's his? Jesse. Yeah. So notice in 11 verse 1, this isn't the verse that's being quoted, but when you read the whole chapter, he tells you in verse 1 that there's going to be a branch. Now is that the root or the offspring? That's the offspring. So right here in verse 1, he tells you that this guy that's going to reign and rule over the Gentiles, he's the offspring of Jesse. That's all that you know so far. Keep reading. Look at verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove, or af reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. This is obviously speaking of his second, of his, his return of the Armageddon battle, right? So it says, Of his lips shall he slay the wicked, and righteous shall be of the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reign. So these are all prophecies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then it explains to you here, it talks about the millennial reign, verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lion, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. It's talking about a time of peace that there's never been, right? It says, and, uh, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. So this is the millennial reign of Christ, the time of peace. For the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now look at verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Did you notice that? 11 verse 1 tells you that he's the offspring of Jesse. He's the branch of Jesse. And then 11 verse 10, which is what's quoted in Romans chapter 15 verse 12, tells you that he is the root. So right here in just uh, 10 verses, you have a clear teaching of the same thing that Jesus said. I am the root and the offspring of Jesse. He's the offspring of, of Jesse in 11 verse 1. He's the root of Jesse in 11 verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to it shall the Gentiles see, and his rest shall be glorious. Notice it says his rest. It's speaking of the time of peace. The Bible's awesome, man. And keep reading here, too. There's something else. That I, I, I've read this in commentaries. I'm going to confess to you the first, like, five times that I read my Bible. I had a Schofield Bible. And I would very occasionally look at the notes if I just couldn't understand something. And I always looked at this. And I've looked this up in other, you know, in other commentaries and stuff. Because I've heard this preached wrongly. Verse 11 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria. I've always heard them say in verse 11 here that this is him recovering them the second time because he recovered them from Egypt. And the second time is him recovering them from, uh, you know, right here from Babylon, right? But, but watch what it's talking about. Because what were we just speaking about? The millennial reign, right? What happens before the millennial reign? When he, when, let's just, I'm just, it, I mean, this should be pretty simple. What happens before the millennial reign when he gathers his people? When does he gather? The day of the Lord, the rapture, right? What's, watch this, it's real interesting. So he says, 
He will gather them again the second time to recover the, the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathras and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. Now, does this sound like they're coming out of Egypt? Just Egypt? No. You know, this is talking about him recovering them from the Babylonian captivity. But notice he says he will recover them a second time. So he's saying, I'm going to recover them from the Babylonian captivity, but then after that, I'm going to recover them a second time. Now look what it says after this. Look at verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. Watch it. And gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now what does that make you think of? From being gathered from the four corners of the earth. Talks about when he, he shall send his angels and they'll gather together. So the second time is when he gathers them together for the rapture. And then what takes place almost immediately right after that is when we go into the millennial reign. So that makes perfect sense for him to start speaking about this. Right after that, he's going to tell you about the second time when he gathers together all those of Israel. We're not preaching through uh, Isaiah 11. Go back around Romans chapter 15. I know I spent a while on that. Go back to Romans chapter 15. We're only going to be going through half the chapter of Romans chapter 15. Because it's a pretty lengthy chapter. Look at verse 13. It says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So notice that you access that by faith. That he may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And he says, and I myself also, and I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, goodness filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. So he's saying, I believe that you're able also to admonish one another. Admonish is like is, is somewhat like a warning, correcting someone, but it's like teaching, right? It means to, it means really to give counsel. But oftentimes people are, they're, they're making a decision that they either need to go one way or the other when you're giving them counsel, or they can be in trouble. That's oftentimes why it's like a warning or means counsel. That's what admonish means. So he says, admonish one, one another, verse 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort, he's saying in a way, as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. Verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, mis uh, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So we can see that Paul was sanctified by the Holy Ghost in his mission of going to the Gentiles. A lot of people say, Paul was a false prophet. There's many people that say, this, especially like hardcore Hebrew Israelites. You know, uh, the, these Hebrew roots, Hebrew Israelites, Hebrew roots people, they'll say Paul was a false prophet. Anything that Paul said, you know, is heresy and it should not be regarded. And the reason why they say that is because Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Paul wrote Romans chapter 14 and Paul wrote Colossians chapter 2. All of the most clearest passages in the Bible that debunk Hebrew roots type stuff. So they have to like, they look and they're like, well, these are all written by one guy. Well, I guess Paul's a false prophet because they just want to hang on to that, right? But if you say that Paul is a false prophet, you have to say that Peter's a false prophet. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 3. Second Peter chapter number 3. Because they would say, yeah, well, this is the, you know, Peter wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Of course. Well, look at, uh, look at verse, uh, let's start in verse 15. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. So number one, Peter calls him a beloved brother right there. He says that he wrote unto you, right? But he says in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some, some things hard to be understood. He's also admitting like he has a greater wisdom than me. He has a be deeper revelation than I do on a lot of things. And when you read in the Bible, where, where is like the meatiest doctrine? Where's all the doctrine at? It's always in Paul's letters. You know, when you start reading the epistles of Paul, they get, they get more and more difficult as they go in the order that they're in in your Bible. Romans is the easiest. You know what the most difficult book in the New Testament? Speak to even, you know, obviously if we believe that the Greek and the English are perfect and there's no difference, 
Uh, and you look up, you know, from the theologian's perspective, they always say, you know, in the Greek, the most difficult epistle is the book of Hebrews. Do you know in the English what the most difficult epistle is? It's Hebrews. It's because they're identical. When you read the book of Hebrews, it is, the, it is by far the most meatiest book of all of the New Testament. You can just keep studying, keep finding new things, and Peter told you that. Paul had an abundance, and that's why Paul said, you know, I, you know, that God gave him a thorn in his flesh for the abundance of revelations that were given unto him, that he wouldn't be exalted above measure. So God revealed unto him multitudes, you know, of revelations and wisdom and knowledge when it came to doctrine, right? And he gave him a thorn in the flesh so that he wouldn't think he was some great thing. And then you see Peter, and people say, oh, Paul's a false prophet. Then you have to say Peter is too. Because if he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he just called Paul a brother, number one. But not only that, let's keep reading. Watch what he says. In which are some things hard to be understood, about halfway through the verse, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other, look at this, scriptures, under their own destruction. Do you know what Peter just called the things that Paul writes? Scripture. The Bible says in the book of Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know, so Paul told you, well, you can say, well, Paul's not, you know, Paul's definition of Scripture means nothing to me. Paul said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Even Jesus, when he refers to the Bible, always calls it Scripture. The Bible just speaks of it as Scripture. And you see here, what do you see Peter saying? He wrote Scripture. Peter, so you know what you have to do? Toss out Peter. You have to toss out Peter and Paul both if you want to toss Paul out. And, you know, that's why it's important to know that because when people try to come to you, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, you know, don't show me anything out of Paul's, you know, writings or letters. Okay, what about Peter? Yeah, I like Peter. Okay, 2 Peter chapter number 3. Even as, a, you know, our beloved brother Paul has written us in some things which are hard to be understood, people rest the scriptures. It sounds like these people, you know what I mean? The resting Paul stuff. And lying about it? But you get to Romans 15, and what does he say? He says that I should be the minister, verse 16, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that. So he's ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. So in what way would it be acceptable? Being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. That the Holy Ghost was the one that ordained him and sent him for this job. Obviously, God does it through a man when Paul was sent out. He uses men, just like, you know, the Holy Ghost uses men to write down his words, to speak his words. But it was the Holy Ghost that chose Paul to go forth and to preach unto the whole world. Because, you know, the other disciples, they weren't getting the job done. So he assigned that job to someone that would get the job done. And then we have Paul that went forth. We're going to end right there. We have Paul that went forth and preached the gospel. He says, he, he says it in the book of uh, Colossians chapter 1. That the whole world, and you know, as the whole world, he says that you bring forth as as doth it also. I'm sorry, as doth it also in all the world that they bring forth fruit. Those in Colossae, they're they're bringing forth fruit of the gospel as doth it also in all the world. So he and so, and when you look at who's going and preaching the gospel, it's always Paul traveling places, and you know, Peter is like, I'm staying in Jerusalem. Hey, you know. Well, I'm going to, you know, like, let me give you a mission and then we'll get a mission. You should go preach the gospel to everybody and then we're just going to stay here. And that's what you see them doing all throughout, you know, the ministry. Just Peter's just always in Jerusalem. He's just hanging out and staying in Jerusalem, right? And he doesn't want to go anywhere, you know? And, you know, it's interesting you have, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to end the sermon with this. It's totally off topic. But I just thought of, of a revelation because we believe that yeah, I'm going to be preaching just a uh, just to let everybody know I'm going to be preaching soon a series on who the mystery Babylon is and it's Jerusalem and it's super clear. Now listen to this: when Paul writes his last his letter, you know uh, one of his epistles, I believe it's Second Peter three, isn't it? Or is it is it First Peter? Does anybody remember? He says the church at Babylon salute thee, right? He wasn't in physical Babylon. Do you know the very last place where Peter is? It's the last place he's mentioned. Still being in Jerusalem. And, and, and listen to me. He has no desire at all to leave. He's, he's not only in Jerusalem, but he doesn't want to leave. Right? When Jesus, Jesus' last words, this is what I was getting ready to say. Jesus' last words to Peter, do you know what he told him? 
You're gonna, he basically explained to him, you're gonna be crucified. You're gonna die, right? You know, people are gonna carry you where you don't want them to, and they're gonna do, you know, they're gonna crucify you, right? Do you know what Jesus said when he came to Jerusalem? He said, I have to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because the prophet can't die outside of Jerusalem. Yeah. So people say, oh, Peter was crucified in Rome. Not according to Jesus, because the prophet can't die outside of Jerusalem. Yeah. And then we look up, and where do we see Peter last? In Jerusalem. And what does he say? The church at Babylon salutes you. Right? And, and we know for a fact that he told them. Doesn't that make perfect sense that he would lie, that the very last place he would be is in Jerusalem? And then Jesus says, a prophet has to die in Jerusalem. And then you hear, and when he says a prophet has to die, he's talking about martyrs. Because when it talks about even the reason why a prophet has to die in Jerusalem is because he says that on thee, talk about Jerusalem, that all the righteous bloodshed may come. He's like, I'm going to make sure that I come to Jerusalem and that I die in Jerusalem because when I punish you, mystery Babylon, when I bring the punishment upon you, that all the righteous bloodshed may come upon you. Right. So he's like, hey, Peter, you're going you're gonna to die. You're going to be a martyr. And Peter's like, hey, Paul, just go. I'm going to stay here in Jerusalem. A few years later... He writes an epistle. What's he say? The church at Babylon salutes you. Super clear. Right. Yeah. That's just one of the many points. Right. Many points. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for the clarity of it. We thank you for the Holy Spirit because as, as men, dear Lord, we wouldn't be able to understand it without your Holy Spirit. We thank you, dear Lord, for guiding us in the truth. We ask you to continue to bless us and be with us. Heavenly Father, and uh, just please bless our church. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.